My name is Sherry, and this year I'm managing Binsa competition at Giant Health event. We welcome everyone participating and attending the event. First, I would like to briefly introduce the competition. Binstock is an international healthcare technology startup competition for prizes. Applicants who qualify the standards are invited to pitch their solutions in front of Precious Judge Panel and the entire health and technology ecosystem. Looking at our agenda, we have 10 pitchers who will present their innovative solutions live or via pre-recorded videos. After each pitch, there will be two to three minutes for judges to ask questions. There will also be three speeches from our sponsors. The first speech is right after the introduction video and will be done by GJE, our main sponsor of Giant and Binstock event. The second speech is right after the fifth pitch and will be done by Granted Consultancy. After all 10 pitches from startups, there will be the last sponsor speech from Barclays. At 11.15, judges will have time to organize their assessment score. Then Adam Shaw, our MC, will finally announce the winners at 11.45. The awards are given based on the business stages. We have three business stages. Pollen indicates startups with an early prototype for testing. Bin are startups ready for paying users or patient trials. Lastly, startups in Sprout stage have a functioning product and deployed with live customers. They are ready to scale. We have three startups in Pollen stage, three startups in Bin stage, and four startups in Sprout stage who will compete in each business stage. The awards are given to one overall winner, one Pollen winner, one Bin winner, and one Sprout winner. We officially named our overall winner awards after Michael Series, the founder of Eleven Health and Technologies. Eleven Health and Technologies is the world's first smart care platform for patients with long-term chronic conditions to medical bags. More detailed video of him will be played during Binstock event to honor him. This year, we have many companies providing us with many prizes. GJE provides innovation capture session for bean, pollen, and sprout winner. The session will provide a full IP strategy consultation and report. Details of this session will also be explained in sponsor speech. In addition, all pitchers get IP strategy telephone consultations. The Heart Guide offers first the detailed review of pitch and executive summary to overall winner. In addition, all pitchers get one page review on the pitch and their executive summary. Just Entrepreneurs offer an online interview and one AirPrint magazine subscription for Bean Pollen and Sprout winner. Granted Consultancy provides tailored grant scope and one to one project exploration for Bean Pollen and Sprout winner. In addition, all pitchers get the grant funding landscape guide. More will be explained in the sponsor speech. Octopus Venture this year provides a dedicated session with Octopus Venture's portfolio team to overall winner. Lastly, Giant Health will feature the overall winner and Bean Pollen Sprout winner on Giant Healthy Innovator live TV chat show, as well as on Giant webpage, social media, newsletter, and magazine. In addition, all pictures are also featured on Giant webpage, social media, newsletter, and magazine. I will finish the video by introducing our judge panel. Katerina is a founder and now a product lead of Langtum, a workforce scheduling and staff management platform for, for healthcare. Adam is CEO of the Heart Guy, and he has also been helping business looking to position and pitch themselves correctly for funding. He is MC for today's Binstock event as well. Simon is co-founder of Remind Me Care, health-connected company focusing on products that support consumers and care business involved in care from diagnosis to end of life. Pyler is founder of iExpand, 
an advisory firm focusing on helping digital health companies scale and go global. Lastly, Rorena has been involved in healthcare transformation and innovation for a decade by running many healthcare events and speaking on many stages around the world. Thank you. Hello, and a huge welcome from GJE to everyone out there joining us today for the Beanstalks competition. It's our absolute pleasure to be sponsoring the competition again this year and offering prizes to some of the winners. After chairing the competition last year and seeing the caliber of companies presenting, I'm excited for what we have in store today and particularly now that the competition is reaching even more companies now that it's online. To briefly introduce myself and GJE, my name's Jack Severs. I'm a UK and European patent attorney at GJE, a specialist intellectual property law firm based here in London and in Munich. I lead our specialist medtech and health tech groups, and we specialize in working with health tech companies of all sizes to advise them in developing an IP strategy to protect their innovation and gain the maximum commercial value from it. Now, I've worked with enough founders to know that IP is not always top of their list in terms of considerations in the day-to-day -day running of their business. However, I'm also aware there's lots of misconceptions out there about IP and how to use it effectively. So what I'm going to do today is try to address some of these misconceptions and explain why IP strategy is more than simply registering a few IP rights and ultimately answer the question, why is IP strategy important to health tech startups? Now, I don't need to tell anyone here that we are going through a period of rapid change in healthcare. Our current systems are struggling to cope with these changes and deal with the effects of aging population, climate change and pollution. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic this year has created even more problems for the healthcare system, which I'm pleased to see are being tackled um, by the sheer level of innovation by some of the health tech companies around the world. Now, many of the companies today are pitching solutions associated with some of these problems. And what always gives me hope is that I'm continually reminded in my day job about the level of innovation in health tech. The graph on the right shows the number of patents filed at the European Patent Office last year in the top five technology sectors. In fact, last year was unusual in that it was the first year recorded in which medical technology was not in first place and was pushed into a close second place by the huge increase in the number of applications filed for digital communication technologies. But it's clear that still with almost 14,000 applications for new med tech and health tech inventions last year, it's a field in which innovation is progressing at a rapid rate. And I'm willing to bet with anyone here today that if I'm back here next year, we will see med tech back at the top of that list of technologies in which most applications are being filed, purely because COVID-19 has driven innovation to unprecedented levels. Now, innovation is all well and good, but the companies here today are not aiming to simply be innovative. Their task is to harness that innovation to actually provide some commercial value, to attract investment, grow their companies, so that they can even make even more of an impact in solving those problems. And this is where IP strategy comes in. So many of you will have some knowledge of the different types of IP rights available, patents to protect concepts, trademarks to protect your brand, design rights covering the look of your product and the aesthetics, and know-how to protect your confidential information. And many people assume that that's where IP and my job as a patent attorney ends. But actually, Filling in some paperwork to help you obtain IP rights is really 
only where it starts. And there are two main sides to my job. The first one is working with companies like those here today to help them understand their commercial aims and develop an IP strategy to support those aims. But the other side is working with investors, helping them with IP due diligence, to analyze the IP portfolios of potential investment targets and provide feedback on the strengths and weaknesses so they can make an investment decision. And of course, that understanding of what investors want to see in an IP portfolio helps us to better advise the companies like those here today. So why is IP strategy so important to investors? Well, I think these graphs illustrate it quite nicely. They were taken from a report published last year by economists at the European Patent Office who looked into the relationship between growth rates of SMEs and their IP position. They looked at high growth SMEs across Europe where here they were defined as companies that have an increase in revenue of over 20% annually for three years running. Now, what they found is that, as shown in the, the graph on the left, even obtaining some IP rights increases the chance of growth by over 20% and in increases the chance of the company being a high growth company by 10%. But what's more interesting to me is the graph on the right. This shows that companies with a combination of IP rights, i.e. with a coherent and full IP strategy, are a third more likely to be high growth companies. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that simply obtaining IP rights causes growth, but what it shows is that there's a clear correlation between an integrated IP portfolio and high growth rates. And that is why investors ask us to look into a company's IP position when they are considering investing. So we've seen the value of an IP strategy, but what exactly do we mean by IP strategy? Well, simply put, IP strategy is the coherent use of the IP framework as a whole to support a company's commercial aims. So a lot of companies will file an application and assume that that alone takes care of their IP strategy. We know from our due diligence work that this is not always the case. You can file an application that hasn't got a hope of getting granted, but you can still say that you have a pending patent application. Similarly, on the other side, part of IP strategy is looking at third party rights and how they affect your company. Simply ignoring third party rights, competitors, IP rights is not going to be acceptable in the long run when an investor starts asking you questions about your freedom to operate during due diligence. So what we mean by IP strategy is firstly on one side, do you have a plan for how to identify and capture new innovation in your company? Have you checked that you're clear to use your brand names and have a strategy for when your company develops into different fields or new jurisdictions? And on the other side, can you demonstrate an appropriate approach to managing risk associated with third party patterns? The key point here is that there's no one size fits all approach. The correct approach will come down to your specific business plan and your objectives. So I'd like to illustrate this with a case study. So this is PlaxNap, uh, a company that I've made up based on various examples of, of real cases that I've worked on. So PlaxNap use a mobile phone app and a connecting mouthpiece, which allows you to take a picture of your mouth which is then run through a machine learning algorithm to determine various health indicators relating to your oral health. For example, plaque levels, gum health, and then the data is stored and used to train the algorithm 
for better results. So how do PlaxNAP approach protecting their innovation? Well, clearly a lot of their innovation and value lies in this new machine learning classifier algorithm for analyzing image data to determine oral health conditions. And clearly they want to protect this. Perhaps an investor is asking whether they have appropriately protected it. Have they filed a patent application? Well, can they patent their algorithm? There's a lot of misconceptions around patenting software, but actually the answer is yes. They certainly can patent their algorithm, but is this the right route? If they file a patent application for the specifics of their back end algorithm, this means that they will eventually end up making these details known when they might otherwise have been kept secret. On the other side, would they ever really know if a competitor was using the same algorithm in order to actually enforce their patent against the competitor? So in this case, perhaps they're better off keeping it as confidential know-how, um, which has an unlimited duration of protection, as long as you can keep the, the information confidential. And instead, can they patent the system as a whole? So file a patent application to the combination of the device with the camera, the mouthpiece, and a broadly defined processor to protect the overall system. If possible, this would provide much stronger protection because it's clear if a competitor is using a similar system to you. So that's patents and know-how. What about other IP rights? Well, I was pretty pleased myself with coming up with this company name, but can they protect it? Would it be considered descriptive and therefore not capable of being registered as a trademark? Have they carried out clearance searches to check whether it's actually usable in each of the countries in which they see as their main markets? And what about designs? These are frequently overlooked by companies as another means to protect their innovation. So in this case, a key question is whether the user interface could be protected by a registered design right. If you have a, developed a particularly recognizable user interface, this can provide really solid extra protection, particularly for technologies which are less protectable by patents, for example. So these are the things we're looking for when we talk about an IP strategy. Has the company used the full IP framework to correctly and effectively protect their innovation and the direction in which their innovation is moving in the future? These are the kind of things that an investor will look for when we're carrying out IP due diligence. And so thinking about these earlier can help you to make sure the company is investment ready and ultimately drive growth to allow you to better focus on the problems that you want to solve in the healthcare system. So to return to my original question, why is IP strategy important to health tech startups? The ultimate answer is it's difficult to derive value from your innovation and achieve growth without a credible IP strategy. So just to finish, these are the three practical tips that I would give you um, to summarize what I've said today. Firstly, there's no one size fits all strategy. You need to develop a strategy that fits your business plan. Which aspects of your product do you need to protect? Which can be better protected by know-how? Where will your company be five years down the line? Secondly, I can't stress enough that starting early is crucial to a solid IP strategy. It's much easier to lay solid foundations at an early stage rather than trying to correct mistakes later on. And there's hundreds of examples of this for companies like Monzo who didn't carry out any trademark searches and then had to go through a costly rebrand later on. Finally, when you have an IP strategy in place, write it down and document it. What are you keeping as know-how? Which steps have you taken to keep it secret? And how do you intend to identify further innovations in the future? Having a documented IP strategy 
demonstrates to investors that you have considered your IP strategy carefully and makes you a much more attractive investment target. So that just leaves me to say thanks a lot for listening. Please do come and find us at our, the GJE virtual exhibition stand. We are running free one-to-one -one IP clinics throughout the event to allow you to get some free initial IP advice and ask any questions that you have on IP specific to your business. So thanks again, and let's move on with the competition. My name is Harro Stockman. I'm the CEO of Kepler Vision Technologies. Uh, we are a spin-off from the University of Amsterdam and we developed the first artificial intelligence in the world that looks after the well-being of humans. We focus exclusively on the elderly care market and the problems there. First of all, it is impossible to hire caregivers. They are not there. Secondly, due to aging population, there's a 6% year over year demand in growth for care. Our solution is the Kepler Night Nurse, uh, which reduces the workload of caregivers by 40% at night. How it works? Um, there is a camera that looks like a smoke sensor. It has a small lens. It observes what is going on in the room. It transmits its video signal to a small mini computer. Uh, the mini computer does the heavy lifting in machine learning and computer vision and it recognizes if a patient is in bed, out of bed, uh, in the bathroom, in the bathroom too long, left is leaving his room, fallen on the floor. And if so, if something goes wrong and only if something goes wrong, we send a message to the nurse call system to get uh, the attention of the nurse. Uh, the market size for this is gigantic. Um, if we focus only on the elderly care, so ignoring um, mental care, home care, uh, hospitals, uh, the market size is 44 million beds worldwide. Uh, for the Netherlands, the UK and the US only, uh, there are 1.9 million beds and the serviceable attainable market is 1900 million euros per year. Uh, our team, we are now with 15. This is our third year. We have uh, seven PhDs. Team is pretty much complete, but we are actively looking for extra sales. Um, previous exits by team members have been to Union Park Capital and to Qualcomm, and we licensed the pet previous patent portfolio to Microsoft, Spotify, and RPX. Our revenue is, uh, model is very simple. We have a recurring licensing model, software as a service, and we charge per video stream per month. Our key expenses, uh, right now, they are pretty much evenly divided over four sources, personnel, cost of sales, hardware, and managed services. But as we will grow, um, the, re the main key expenses will be the cost of sales and the cloud costs and the hardware costs. Uh, competitive advantages, first of all, we are a university spin-off, which provides us access to talent. We raised over 4 million in funding. Uh, we have all the certifications in place to be able to process patient data. We have two patents awarded and we have eight applications pending. We collected so much training data right now that uh, we have one false alarm per 186 days per patient, which is uh, incredible. Uh, we are registered as a medical device now in Europe, and we have signed our first multi-year recurring license agreement. That's Kepler Vision. Thank you very much. The AI component in it is, uh, is that we have to train the computer vision machine learning to get to this uh, result. Cost implication on that? Is it much more expensive than the other on the market? No, it is, uh, it is a lot uh, cheaper even because the, uh, 
the existing domotica can uh, be replaced. In general, there are four or five different uh, domotica things like bed, bed sensors, bed mats, uh, floor sensors, door sensors. These can all go. Cost implication on that? Is it much more expensive? Than and how difficult is it to install this in a care home? Like how long does it take to get it set up and get them started with it? We have a demo that we can give, that we can set up within 10 minutes. Uh, in the end, uh, the placement of the optical sensors is the most uh, time consuming part. So for that, uh, for every room, this takes about uh, 30 minutes. And what's the biggest pushback you get when you're trying to sell this to a care home? Why do people not want to buy this? Um, or what are they worried about? Yeah, yeah. so the uh, personnel, strangely enough, is uh, worried about uh, losing their jobs. Um, the uh, nurses uh, may not like it because they like to keep things as they are. Um, other than that, uh, the, usually the, the, the chief financial officer is our best uh, friend. Presumably it integrates for an API with, a, with care planning software? Yeah. Yes, it does. It, we integrate with the nurse call system. Any issues with um, sort of global exp expansion in terms of, for example, HIPAA in the US? What was the last question? Any issues with regard to regulatory compliance, for example? HIPAA? Yeah. Uh, so we have to deal with the regulations in uh, Europe. And I think they are, they will be slightly different in the US. Uh, but I assume, we assume that in, in Europe they are more strict than in the US. But, I, you know, we, 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 have, we have jumped through a number of, uh, I don't know if that is a good expression, but, you know, we were, we had to get uh, ISO certification for the Netherlands, uh, NEN certification. We also registered as a medical device in Europe. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we can deal with that, whatever, whatever, whatever comes up. Okay, I believe that's probably our two minutes um, used up there, folks. Thanks very much, Harrow. Nice job there. And it looks like you've achieved some phenomenal stuff there. And uh, regardless what happens today, I, I'm sure that you're going to fly with that. It looks great. Thank you, Adam. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, judges. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks very much. Okay, the next, uh, our, our next one up is uh, Patch AI, I believe. Do we have the video for that or the presentation ready? Right, sure, Adam. Um, I mean, we decided to do it live anyway. So here I am, representative of Patch AI, Kumara Palaniwil. So let me share my screen with you guys very fast. Okay, so I just need confirmation that everyone can see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so without further ado, uh, my name is Kumar Palaniwil, co-founder and the chief business development officer at Patriai. And what we've done is we created the first virtual assistant for the purpose of patient engagement within clinical trials, as well as routine care. 15 years, $2 billion. That is how long it takes to get a new drug to the market. But it's also true that a lot of evidence is needed to be generated in order to get a new drug to the market and clinical trials need to be conducted. But the problem is clinical trials are expensive and highly inefficient. 85% you know, of them get delayed and 50% of patients either miss therapies or struggle to cope with all the tasks and visits that come with participating within clinical research. So evidence generation becomes an issue and it is highly flawed. And this can have a health economic impact of up to 6 million per day, every single day for every single drug. The problem is we have instruments like this on paper being used to collect data from patients over a period of two years. So you can imagine a patient having to fill this out for over 700 days for 50% of trials, but then there are digital solutions on the market, but they're not a lot different because they take what's on paper and put it on a screen no wonder patient engagement is super, super low. And while there are a lot of market leaders who managed to like, you know, introduce their solutions in the market, we're trying to do something different because we envisioned a better way because we decided to make it conversational, which is more adaptive and predictive. 
And eventually we try to make it more human, but also something that can be customized, which makes us much, much better in terms of project delivery compared to our competitors. So going to the solution per se, what we do is we collect behavioral data from patients and translate that into our machine learning engine to create a personalized conversational strategy to adapt to patients' daily routines and everyday needs in order to empower them to report more robust health data, which would provide real-time analytics for clinical research and doctors to make informed clinical decisions. And so to give you an example of how we do it, you know, depending on the level of engagement, we try to adapt the tone of voice of the chatbot. You know, if the level of engagement is high, we try to motivate the patients and give them more achievement badges, so to speak. Slightly lower, and we try to get them back on track, even though they've been doing pretty well of late. And once engagement gets really low, we try to take a more empathetic manner to how we handle patient engagement and try to push out more notifications to get the patients back on track. So Patchy's value proposition hinges on patient engagement from clinical research all the way to clinical practice by offering a modular conversational AI platform, which personalizes how data is collected from patients, thus truly embracing the doctrine of personalized medicine. So it could either be that we can help patients report symptoms in real time, but also get reminders for all the therapies that they're required to take. But also in the wake of the COVID pandemic, we've introduced video visits so that they can engage with their healthcare professionals in real time, but most importantly, also gather important data from connected devices and wearables and introduce elements such as gamification to improve overall patient experience. But does Patchia really engage? Because with paper solutions, we get an average compliance of 11%. With other standard solutions, we get 80%. Patchia produces 95% daily compliance with therapy, remind therapy plans, as well as uh, daily questionnaires and diaries. And how have we proven this success so far? So our recent success story comes with Roche where we deploy the first digital solution in Italy for all oncology patients on a nationwide level. And we also helped Novartis launch the first ever digital trial in Italy through for a breakthrough therapy with a neuroscience. And we wanna use this momentum working with two of the three top pharma companies in the world, having generated half a million in revenue in 2020 to achieve more scalability in product, to go in for a series A, but eventually the scope of becoming a digital therapeutic in the long term as well. So far, an average of 28, almost 30,000 new products per year, almost 7 billion in value. We hope to get just 80 in five years to meet our required targets and get 32 million in revenues. So we have a current ongoing round, which is a bridge capital before the series of 1.7 million, of which 100% has been committed. And we have a, a team of around 20 superstars comprising doctors, research nurses, and nurse directors backed by a team of very talented business development and product development software engineers who are working tirelessly to create the best product possible. So join us today to revolutionize clinical research and care pathways through patient engagement at every step. Thank you. Um, as far as engagement with your app, I mean, how much um, traction are you getting with that at the moment? I mean, with the patients per se, uh, we have about a cohort of 100 to 200 patients using the app from our first clinical trial with Novartis, which we went live earlier this year. And I'm happy to report that we have an average of daily compliance of 95% with uh, reporting therapy intake, as well as uh, you know filling out daily diaries, as well as the protocol mandated pre-oral questionnaires. And this is a small sample size, but we're trying to build upon this metrics. And also we have 100% retention so far, especially in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I also have a question, uh, Kumara, congratulations for your product. Um, given that you are so close to the patient with what you're doing, uh, I appreciate you have nurses as experts um, in your leading team. What about patients? Do you think to bring the patients on your leading team as well? Of course, it's why we actually partner with a lot of patient associations so that for every single feature we release, we sit down with the patient experts and advocates to sort of help them, I mean, for them to help us understand if every new feature we deploy is of actual value to patients. So we conduct a lot of UATs, keep continuously continue getting feedback from patients and patient experts to ensure that we're not just a patient-centric solution on paper, but then we actually have the backing from the experts themselves in terms of what patients would love to use. 
And then your second uh, quick one, you mentioned that you'd like to become a digital therapeutic. Mm -hmm. uh, any ideas you'd like to share with us about those plans? Sure. So on top of this ongoing collaboration with Roche in Italy, we are trying to focus on this use case for oncology where we realized, you know, the purpose of the solution is to sort of personalize it to patients' needs and sort of improve their experience and indirectly, you know, empowering them to report more data, take their therapies on time and trying to demonstrate an improvement in their overall clinical outcomes. So we're slowly building the clinical validation roadmap for becoming a DTX and we planned a couple of pilots through collaborations with EID Health and other organizations to sort of do small, you know, living uh, test bits and demonstrate some metrics before we decide to launch the DTX program. Can you um, compete with the likes of Medidata? Um, I mean, do you have anything that is IPable or unique that wouldn't stop them just coming in and saying, do you know what, let's personalize ourselves? That's a great question indeed. And what they notice with all the market leaders is that they have, uh, they don't have like shrink wrapped or configurable solutions, but rather they have standard solutions that they provide to global CROs and pharma companies across the world at very high prices. So we're trying to overcome the barrier that they've experienced in Europe, especially because of the stringent regulations and trying to use not only our local presence, but also the fact that we offer our solutions at cheaper prices but that we are also capable of offering different modules according to the needs of every single trial. So having worked with Novartis and Roche, we're trying to do the system where we're trying to upsell through our collaborations with them and subsequent CROs to get more presence in the European market before you know, directly jumping into the North American market, which is just swimming with sharks at the moment. <laughs> That's great. I think that we're gonna have to curtail it there, Kamara, but great job. Um, nice presentation and and a really good idea as well thank you thank you so much okay so next next we have lined up um chin have we got chin ready to uh, present to us hi yes good morning everyone um so let me share my screen my name is Shia Wedja, uh, not actually uh, Shokwa. I also have a twin brother who's working with us on the team and I wasn't able to create a separate profile. Um, and today I'm gonna be telling you about uh, CHIN, uh, the Critical Healthcare Information Integration Network, a platform we've been working on over the past several months um, that we intend to be a bridge between disconnected healthcare providers and dependable medical information. Um, so let's start with a, a brief hypothetical. Um, let's take this hypothetical community health worker um, who's recently trained and is now working in, in her area and doing ground. Um, she heard from a colleague about a Lassa fever outbreak that was uh, occurring elsewhere in the country, but is yet to, to impact their area. And because it's not prevalent in their area and because she's completely offline, uh, she has no access to up-to-date federal guidelines or other disease information that might be found via online resources. Um, as she's making her rounds for that day, she comes across a patient uh, presenting with fever, weakness, um, and a strange facial pain. And thinking that it might be last of fever, she'd like to get more current information about the disease but has nowhere to turn. Uh, so this is a hypothetical situation that could face many real community health workers throughout uh, the African continent. Uh, for those who don't know, community health workers are a crucial part of African health systems. It's estimated that uh, they serve nearly 700 million people throughout the continent and often serve as the first uh, point of entry for many people into the healthcare system uh, by providing a wide variety of very important uh, health interventions. Uh, typically, when a community health worker is uh, entering the field, uh, they undergo a one-time training that could last on the order of weeks to months. Um, and that's then followed by a series of intermittent though important uh, refresher trainings. Um, and it's been demonstrated that in the absence of those refresher trainings, um, there could be issues with knowledge attrition and skill attrition. Um, however, those refresher trainings and continually bringing in people um, for in via expenses such as transportation and meal supplies, honorariums, et cetera, could become quite costly. And it's been shown that um, with the implementation of a blended training model combining in-person and electronic training, uh, there could be savings of up to 42% on total cost. Um, so this is just to provide evidence that um, uh, uh, 
electronic medical reference tool could be both a performance enhancing and cost saving measure uh, for these workers. Um, however, it's not so easy to implement such an intervention um, in Africa, particularly in the rural parts of the continent due to low internet penetration. Uh, but we could turn to uh, alternative connections or alternative uh, technologies um, such as SIM connections, which have much higher penetrance. So to address this problem, we made Shin, which is a free for use SMS messaging system that provides validated medical information on the causes, presentations, management, and associated complications for context relevant diseases for the, the community health workers where they are uh, in these rural settings. So our team synthesizes this information from internationally acclaimed uh, online medical reference sources, such as the Mayo Clinic, CDC, and WHO, as, as well as any lo local information that we get from our partners. And we put that into digestible text message format, and that can be sent to our offline community health workers. All, of course, with the goal of providing higher quality of care. So the way it works is that the user would register and then use the chatbot. The chatbot connected via Twilio accesses our backend in Firebase. And without the, without the community health worker needing to access Wi-Fi, they can get any of the information that they need that's already stored on our databases. So um, evidence from a lot of previous mobile health interventions um, in Africa and various other kind of resource limited settings have shown that success is really predicated upon building a sustainable financial model, even in this context of a nonprofit. So as such, we've based our model on a structure that creates value for each of the key stakeholders in the process. So private and corporate donors have improved marketability in these lower resource settings through a tax exempt donation process. Um, mobile network operators can expand their network or their market reach through um, ensuring more continuous service engagement from customers who might be less, I guess, want to try to um, engage with such service services. Um, governments have an investment vehicle that's aligned with their national pr health priorities. And most importantly, uh, community health workers have access to a service that can lead to better health for those around them. So to begin the validation of our platform, we are piloting um, CHIN in collaboration with Rural Health Mission Nigeria. They're an NGO based in northern Nigeria that helps train hundreds of community health workers and deploys them throughout rural areas in the region. Um, so starting next week, actually, we'll begin onboarding health workers onto our platform and investigating the impact that um, having ready access to reference information is having on their ability to provide the highest quality of care using uh, certain survey tools and assessment metrics that we've designed. So we are a team of Africans with a vested interest in supporting African health systems. We have a variety of technical expertise, clinical acumen, and a real passion for creating change in the continent that's driven us through this pursuit so far. And we're excited to see how Giant Health can possibly play a role in helping us go further along our journey. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, well, first of all, con congratulations. Congratulations, because it's a great and much needed solution. Um, sometimes we forget that uh, SMS and other more frugal tools are what some geographies need. Um, I have a question regarding the business model. Um, Initially, it's free for use, of course, for the health workers. And at the moment, it's very donor uh, or grant focused, you know, from MNOs or other organizations. But who do you foresee paying for the solution moving forward in the next stage? Yeah, there's kind of um, two types of, I guess, approaches that have worked for other types of similar interventions in the past. One is kind of more of a fee for service type model where the end user is perhaps like a little bit more higher resource, like rather than a community health worker, for example, would be like a practicing physician or somebody with a little bit more willingness to invest financially in these kind of performance improving tools. But um, in the context of a community health worker who typically is just someone from the community who volunteers to provide these health services to people around them, 
they will have less of an incentive to like spend their own resources on something like this. So we think that um, government collaborations will probably be the kind of path to deployment that'll give us the most, or the position us the best to kind of have a sustainable um, funding source for the, uh, I guess the cost related to the platform. And um, how accurate is it? So like, what are the chances that somebody texts, uh, sends an SMS to get some information and it returns something completely random, well, not completely random, but like not what they're looking for? How have you kind of improved the accuracy of the product? So I think we, we've dealt with a lot of the potential accuracy issues by rather than trying to uh, uh, get, collect information from ourselves and like generating it ourselves uh, instead, um, using other already established sources to to create the summaries that we're sending. Um, so uh, Ebube mentioned, for example, uh, referencing sources from the Mayo Clinic, uh, WHO, CDC, and other places that like offer information that's well validated and well sourced. So we're not necessarily putting ourselves in this process by being our own knowledge creators. Yes. Anytime that we give information to an end user, it's also sent with the source. Now that source is a shortened link and we don't expect them to necessarily access that short in real time given the issue is Wi-Fi, um, but we always send out that information as well. Great, thanks. Yeah. You mentioned a few revenue streams, uh, so outside governmental organizations, uh, you mentioned private organizations as well, could you clarify this? Sorry, you mentioned what type of organizations? governmental, like uh, public health authorities. Yes. Yeah, so, so aside from those, you mentioned other streams as well. Could you clarify on the other streams of revenue? Yeah, so I mean, the two kind of um, like parties within the private sphere that I was considering are primarily like corporations with healthcare kind of objective and objective and interest then also the mobile network operators who um, oftentimes for these types of M health interventions will provide funding to some extent in order to increase the number of customers who are then um, kind of providing an additional kind of revenue stream for the mobile network operator themselves. So in return for uh, kind of spreading their or largening their customer pool by reaching these perhaps harder to reach markets, um, they, the operators themselves will help support your um, initiative, or in this case, our um, mobile health initiative. I understand. Thank you. Do you have any feedback from the private clients? At the moment, no. It's pretty much just um, kind of preliminary conversations that we've had with a number of different stakeholders to get a sense of how we can create this kind of sustainable model, but we don't have any sort of uh, kind of specifics laid out at the moment. Really well done. I mean, that that's really ambitious what you're up to there and obviously much needed. So thanks very much. Great uh, to have the opportunity uh, today to uh, share my story. My name is Yves Prevot. I'm the founder and CEO of Easy. And uh, uh, this story started some four and a half years ago when I had uh, a personal moment of clarity, uh, that moment that you realize and, uh, and see all things very clearly. And for me, it was uh, uh, when um, I learned that if you really want to make a change or have big impact, you have to be willing to leave everything that you currently am or have behind. And that resonated with myself. So I quit my job. I was working at a large pharmaceutical company at the time, which is also pretty famous today. They're called Pfizer. And uh, I jumped into this adventure that brought me here today with you. And this adventure is all about vision. And vision in the sense of seeing clearly. Um, I don't know if you can see my slides, but I will advance them. Um, if I don't hear any no's, then uh, I'm assuming that you can see it because I can't see myself anymore. Um, vision. And vision uh, is totally outdated in the way we actually um, uh, monitor it and treat it. And um, 
the world is really moving forward pretty fast, which we, of course, can see today uh, because we are having a conference even uh, completely uh, virtual. Um, and that requires um, a new approach. And uh, we are this new approach. We have developed um, a clinically proven online eye exam, which is really a medical grade technology. Um, so it's a, a medical device that allows uh, patients and consumers to test their eyes at home and uh, for vision uh, providers to actually monitor their patients remotely um, uh, and do perform telemedicine. So how does it work? The only thing you need is actually all the things that you have already in front of you, a laptop you and a smartphone, which I'm assuming you also have, and three meters or 10 feet of space. And then during the test, your remote control actually uh, functions as a uh, as a uh, your phone uh, functions as a remote control, and on the screen images are displayed just like going to a regular eye test. The webcam uh, that monitors the user during the test, so making sure that he's at the right or she is at the right distance, and the light conditions in the room are taken into account. And then after the test, the results are sent to one of our optometrists who validates the results and can issue a prescription for eyewear that can be contacts or glasses, or uh, the results are sent to an ophthalmologist uh, in uh, the course of clinical practice. So what makes us unique? Actually three things. First, the state of the art technology. So we use the latest and greatest in tech uh, that allows us to do um, an eye test reliably on any device through web-based technology. So we can be sure that uh, people uh, do a quality eye test. It doesn't matter what the laptop or the smartphone functionality is. It's infinitely scalable. Even today, we can handle millions of users and it's easy to use. Our users rate uh, the experience of the test with a 4.3 out of five. The second is probably even more uh, important is uh, it's a quality assured medical device. So uh, we are CE certified, uh, but also have a quality management system by ESO. And we are clinically proven uh, in terms of our accuracy. And then in terms of traction, this year was being it was, was an amazing year for us because we could actually add a lot of value with our technology. We helped hospitals uh, performing remote uh, eye tests, uh, especially when they were in lockdown. And in this way, we definitely made uh, a lot of steps towards our vision, which is helping uh, uh, people uh, with poor vision, which are 4.3 billion people around the world to solve um, their problem. Uh, when it comes to um, um, uh, the traction, we can also split it in two ways. Uh, we are helping uh, eyewear companies to do a digital transformation. And we are partnering now with the biggest uh, retail company in the world, Grand Vision, the biggest e-commerce player in Europe, Mr. Specs, the fastest growing uh, omni-channel brand, Ace and Tate, and the largest health insurance company in the Netherlands. In ophthalmology, we are uh, starting a clinical trial for cataract patients in January with five of the leading centers in the ne Netherlands, Germany, and Austria. Uh, but we have uh, also started clinical trials in uveitis, children with myopia progression, and embolopia. So super proud where we are today uh, because uh, we are definitely uh, making some impact on our mission, which is to improve the lives of billions of people around the world with easy access to better vision and eye care. Thank you. Great job. Thanks very much. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off then. I mean, it, it looks like there's a lot of traction. Uh, the, the question that I, um, I have is, is there any equipment needed by the, the, by the users? Is it just a laptop? Do they just flip open their laptop and, and then they have access to this? Is that, is that how it operates? 
that's exactly how it operates. Well, you need also a smartphone uh, because uh, uh, the the test will instruct you to uh, go, go to a three meter distance and you have to be able to operate the test from there. But that's the only thing uh, you need, a laptop, a smartphone and internet access. Right. So you mentioned that you had a great year, you know, with uh, yeah. some good implementations. Congrats, it looks great. Uh, could you give us some of the feedback? Did you have any hiccups? Of course, we always have hiccups. Um, I think our biggest problem at the moment is that uh, we, uh, we, are, we are a software medical device, so we uh, have quality and uh, reliability high uh, uh, in our priority list, uh, and we can uh, 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 help people with refractive errors up to minus three and a half. So that's only 25% of the population, which is still a great solution, but we are more ambitious than that. Ambitious than that. So next year we want to uh, extend the range to also include higher myopic patients and also move into the elderly population where people uh, above 45 that have presbyopia can also start doing our tests. So you are still investing heavily in uh, research and development. Is that correct? That is correct. When I go to the optician, they do a, a range of tests, and many of those seem physical to me, and some seem quite sophisticated. Is your system literally replacing all of the tests, or is it a, a reduced suite of tests? Exactly. Uh, you already gave your answer uh, yourself. So what we do is refraction and visual acuity. So we measure uh, what is the quality of someone's sight and what is uh, the strength that you need for glasses or contacts. We are uh, uh, no comprehensive eye health exam. So if you have health problems, then uh, we, of course, ask this and we also uh, are able to detect this in some uh, cases. And then we refer um, uh, the user or the patients to the, to the right care. But you're not going to visit to the optician, you're just speeding up the, the initial process. Yes. Um, um, both. We also are replacing some of the visits uh, when it comes to, for example, um, um, just reordering uh, a pair of glasses. Um, and then uh, we just make sure that you have the right prescription because it can change from uh, prescription to prescription. And then if there are no healthcare problems, then uh, you can order your glasses uh, or contacts online. Can I have a quick question? Um, um, since you only do triage or digital front door um, activities, how how much would you have to integrate into the clinical systems on the other end? And what is the pathway to get there? Yes, uh, very good question. So uh, this is also in terms of hiccups, uh, uh, maybe another bottleneck that we are facing because we are a very small company, of course, and uh, hospitals are pretty big and have, uh, have a lot of uh, other priorities. Um, so one way that we do this, uh, we teamed up for uh, with an electronic healthcare record uh, provider for ophthalmology clinics here in the Netherlands, and they integrated it uh, into their system and then sell it as a complete package uh, to, uh, to eye clinics. That's one way to do it. The other way is also we work together with health insurance companies and see if they can help us speed up digitalization in the hospital and making this... Uh, um, yeah, making this uh, implementation go smoother because we do think there's a, a, a quite a big value add. We can save hospital visits. Uh, that's a saving of 200 uh, to 250 euros per visit. Um, and uh, for cataract patients uh, alone, we uh, expect that we can halve the number of required visits. That's Thank great. You. Thanks very much. Um, nice presentation. Great idea as well. Uh, so next in line, we've got Superfield Solutions. Hi there. My name is Abdullah Rahim. I'll be presenting the MedicTech pitch for Superfield Solutions. Here is a scenario. I'm a young man in a developing country. Say Nigeria, for instance. I'm working in nine to 10 hour shifts daily, an average earner, and I have little time for anything else. Then I fall ill. To access care, I must go to a hospital, wait in line for about an hour to see a medical doctor. That affects my working hours. There are more medical doctors out there. However, 
with 40% of them unemployed, I must make do with what I find in the hospital. I have to visit a particular facility where my medical records are stored because no other facilities has them. This scenario illustrates the basic challenges faced by people in many developing countries in accessing medical care. Excessive waiting times, inadequate health personnel, and poor access to medical records. And this is how we are using Meditech to resolve them. Meditech, as a healthcare mobile platform, efficiently schedules meetings between clients and medical personnel, eliminating waiting times. The platform collects and validates the medical licenses of healthcare personnel to ensure that there are more of them available to provide health services, hence creating jobs. And finally, it provides an online database of health and treatment history that allows me to be treated anywhere by any health personnel because I have my medical records on my electronic device. Hence, providing flexible medical care. This is how it works. A client simply signs into a mobile application, fills out a short inquiry form, accepts the cost of treatment, and a medical doctor is sent to his location to provide treatment to him. Our target are the youth in uh, urban settlements. We are looking at uh, people between the ages of 25 and 65 years because these people are these people make up the bulk of those in the formal sector and are more open to the use of technology and innovations like this. Our team consists of people with experiences in project management, medical uh, uh, advisors, software designers, human resource personnel, program support, and business advisory. Our new model is charging commissions on services, uh, service payments that have been made to medical personnel on the platform, and charges for account registrations. We will establish partnerships with licensing bodies to validate licenses of medical personnel, engage indigenous health care providers to provide care and treatment services at affordable prices. In partnership, we are, we are going to be in partnership with healthcare insurance companies at some point in the future. We, we, also, we also expect to explore a uh, conversion of individuals in the data, database held by these companies. Then we will use a mix of digital and traditional campaigns to create knowledge about demand for the product. Our key expenses will cover logistics, application development, licensing, and staffing. In conclusion, Meditech is going to provide three basic opportunities. One is efficient treatment timing. Two, jobs for healthcare personnel. And three, better access to data uh, for treatment and, um, and patient monitoring. We have a competitive advantage over telemedicine because we can provide physical diagnostics and treatment. Our competitive advantage over physical, visiting physical hospitals is improved data access and creating distance between possibly infectious patients. I believe that with remote services on the increase, Meditech is the healthcare option of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Um, I guess my first uh, question is your rollout strategy. Um, what is the rollout strategy? And uh, uh, is there many users on board at the moment? Hi, Adam. Um, at, the, at this moment, we are um, at the idea stage. We are just um, completing the building of the prototype. As a matter of fact, we had to put some of the work that we're putting in right now on hold just um, to properly answer questions as we stand. So we hope to be finishing the prototype before the first quarter of next year, following which we will be carrying out um, our 
some research, some market research and a market su survey and testing of product um, within the second, the first and the second quarter of next year. Um, we'll continue with that to take us to the end of next year. Then we can see, we'll, we'll take back the feedback that we get and we'll produce a definitive product by the end of next year. We're hoping to launch and scale up within certain communities, um, especially in Nigeria, because we're Nigerian based, um, going for um, over, over the course of 2022. So yeah, that's kind of our rollout strategy. Can I ask, um, what is the uh, the revenue model? Is it commission or is it subscription or, you know, what's the model? The revenue model is supposed to be commissions that will be charged on payments made to uh, medical personnel. Okay. Yeah, but we're looking at in the future, um, one of the things that is growing in developing markets, especially in Africa, which I know for, for healthcare financing in Africa is um, healthcare insurance. Now, it's a very vast, important field that is not being fully explored. And we're seeing this as an opportunity to explore the, um, essentially the opportunities for healthcare financing in, in Africa. Um, as of today, less than 20% of um, people who live in Nigeria, for example, or as a matter of fact, in sub-Saharan Africa have access to um, healthcare insurance, um, really because of geographic locations, really because of other small challenges that can be that can be overcome. We are hoping to use tech, the tech systems to overcome these barriers. So this is a first phase that we are hoping to expand on in future. I've got a, I've got a good question on the on the go-to-market model, if I may. And yep. I appreciate that we are still in the polling state, but um, um, typically your solution will be focused on, you know, young or well be, you know, well, uh, well to be to do population from big city centers like Abuja. Yeah. But, um, but obviously in Nigeria, there is a huge capacity gap there are not enough doctors or clinicians for the population. So I was wondering um, if you are thinking of pivoting for the rest of the country in the future with services that would be web-based or as a proper telehealth platform because of that, instead of making the appointments with real doctors, maybe triaging or, or providing some services for those places where there are not doctors to see. Um. Yes, it does seem like if I'm saying yes to everything that, but yes, it's something that we thought about. It's something that is in development stages. We understand that there might be burnout of, because really most solutions in Nigeria are focused at people, at the same people, right? So what we're looking at is that in long term, when we're able to consolidate, then we can, be, we can use it as a pivot to enter into other markets. We can go to... Um, remote communities, in a, for example, in Cameroon, and provide them healthcare services. It might not be the same model that we're using today, but down the line in the future, when we've explored the market, what is most important to us is knowing that we, we knowing what is on ground, because there's a large quantity of data, there's almost no data anywhere. So we want to know what is happening, get a true representation of what is happening before we pile things on the present strategy we can use this as a foundation, then we can add on um, insurance schemes, then we can add on community medicine programs that amplify the small number of medical practitioners that we have to reach, hard to reach areas using tech solutions. So yes, it's something that we have thought of. Thank That's you. great, thanks David. We're gonna to have to move on now. Um, we've got a talk, I think, by Paul Gordon next as an interlude. Um, while we have a little chat about the, the process so far. Okay. Michael was my friend for 20 years, and this is my story about the relationship, the special relationship that he and I had. When we first met, um, it was through our kids. Our kids went to the same school. We've got three children, more or less exactly the same age, and our wives have become great friends. And certainly for the first um, couple of years of, of our friendship, it was mainly around the subject of football and politics and, and increasingly business. 
And Michael at the time was a licensing agent and a really good one and was doing some great work for some global brands, Juventus, um, in, on, the, on the toy side. He did a lot of work for Disney and McDonald's um, and was really, really exceptionally good at it um, and would have, been, would, would have created a phenomenal global licensing business. But um, illness was always there um, and, um, and often got in the way of some of the, some of the great um, opportunities that Michael had presented um, to him. Um, but what it did do, this particular phase of his life, taught him about how you manufacture, um, because he manufactured um, uh, toys in China. And of course, as we know, that was particularly useful um, in the years to come. Um, as I say, Michael, Michael was often ill, and um, our friendship was, um, was um, uh, typified by quite often him being around and then quite often not being around. Um, so um, that culminated in, in um, his... Um, a uh, long, long period of, um, of hospitalization at UCH. And I'd go and see him three or four times a week um, and we chat and we talked about business and we said, wouldn't it be great if we could end up doing something together? Um, he was always, um, he was always pretty prophetic in, um, in his uh, forecasting. Michael's transplant changed him. Um, it, 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 it was almost like um, a sense that he needed to do something meaningful with his life. And he talked about how, um, rather like Holocaust survivors who, were, who, who often feel that they were spared to do something. He felt that um, he was spared to do something. And that was the genesis for Eleven Health. Um, so as we all know, he started, in, he started in Eleven Health, or what became Eleven Health, from his hospital bed by hacking a sensor to essentially turn um, dumb medical bags that hadn't changed for 40 years into smart um, medical bags. Um, and... Um, as you know, as I think most people seeing this video will know, that led to some investment in the UK. But the UK was tough, it was slow, the NHS didn't really understand the, the opportunities presented. So Michael thought, wouldn't it be great to go um, and do something in, in the US to see if um, the business could scale more quickly, more rapidly there. Um, and that's what it did. I mean, not many people do that, but Michael did it. Um, and um, uh, he took the business to the US um, and um, uh, and um, uh, I think we all know what happened. But I think bits perhaps that, that aren't known by everybody who's going to see this video are what happened in between. In the five years from Michael um, being pre-transplant to starting the business and for the business to begin to really motor, Michael, Michael, Michael struggled financially. Um, and a lot of people helped him and, and he knew exactly who they were and, and had it all written down and was hoping that one day Eleven Health would be big enough for him to be able to thank um, everybody who helped support him um, and um, uh, and he, he would never have forgotten that he always knew who helped him on the way um, from a personal perspective in that time Michael also taught my son Jack Jack's Bermitzvah and then the result of that is Jack and um, Michael formed this incredibly tight bond um, Michael asked me to join him in the business um, uh, in um, July uh, 20, 2019 and uh, Nicole myself and Jack uh, moved over um, and um, the, the plan was that we would spend minimum two years together. Literally, we were two streets away. Um, we'd see each other every day um, and we'd have a great personal and professional experience helping grow and scale Eleven Health and helping realise the ambitions that Michael had for the business. It wasn't to be. Michael was sick for most of that time. And um, although I saw him in the evenings and many, many, many visits to see him in um, LA in hospital, um, we weren't able to spend that much time in the business together. Um, I think that what's what, what I'd say a little bit about the business moving forward is um, is that he's sown the seeds of what's going to be a fantastic um, business, a business that's about transforming patient care from the inside out, from the patient's needs and out. Um, my job is to be um, a part of that, to continue to be a part of that, to be part of the leadership of the business that's driving driving that vision forward. I take it terribly seriously. I often feel that Michael's on my shoulder um, telling me what he wants me to do. Um, and because we had such such a great tight bond, um, uh, it, it's kind of strange really and surreal, but, but I can sense it. Um, and, and that's what we're about. We're about bringing together the vision that Michael had for the business. Um, the brand and promise that he and I wrote together was one patient at a time. One patient at a time is the articulation of why we exist to do what we do, which is to transform um, healthcare. 
Um, and and I take terribly seriously uh, my responsibilities to the business and into um, and in terms of honouring his legacy. Um, he was rather an extraordinary man in, in some of the press releases around um, uh, around his passing. I used an expression which seemed to be um, seemed to be, be quite well liked, which is he was the smallest giant I knew. Um, I think we all know what that means, um, but he truly was. Um, he was in some ways a genius, an overused term perhaps, but he really was a genius. Um, and um, and uh, um, certainly for me, from my perspective, um, my job is to kind of honour that and to make sure that we at Eleven Health and me as a lifelong friend never lose sight of what, what we exist to do, which is to transform healthcare, um, particularly the area of healthcare that we're in, um, because he never got the opportunity to bring that to fruition. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Williams. I'm the director of Granted Consultancy, and we're one of the sponsors for this year's Beanstalk's Pitch Fest event at Giant Health. This year, we're providing three levels of prizes to um, applicants and entrants to the Pitch Fest event. All entrants to the um, Pitch Fest will get uh, our guide to the grant funding landscape, and that's tailored to the healthcare um, funding landscape in the UK. And we'll use our expertise at Granted Consultancy informed in that report, informed in that uh, uh, guide that you'll get as an entrant to the competition to give you an idea of the best places to look for funding, the best time to look for funding and the key funders and, and the key dimensions of those funders and, this, and also an idea of the current opportunities that are available. So that's the, um, every entrant that applies to the pitch fest will get that from, from, from granted consultancy and that will go uh, to everyone post, post event. For all finalists, so everyone invited to um, pitch on the day at the Giant Health event, we're providing another uh, guide to all finalists, and that will have all of our top tips for, in particular, for grant funding. Um, so it'll be a guide to um, key sources. It's also a guide to, to go through how to secure funding, some ideas of how, over the years, in, in granted, uh, how we secured um, grant funding, non-dilutive funding uh, around innovation and particularly around healthcare for, for, our, um, for our clients and how you might be able to benefit from that. So that's something that we're putting into the pack for all the finalists uh, for the Pitch Fest event. Finally, um, we're providing for the three finalists, the three Beanstalks finalists uh, of the event, providing a, a tailored grant scope. So for those, this is what we do um, with all um, of our clients at Grant Consultancy is will essentially mimic um, uh, the, the initial engagement, but do so on a free, free, free of charge basis for those three finalists, but we'll provide a tailored grant scope. And what that means is we'll do a matching process between the funding needs of those three finalists and against the, the current funding landscape, the current funding needs and the profile, and try and match that up to try and basically develop a report that enables you to best identify the funding opportunities um, that are best suited to you at this moment in time. And in addition to that, as a follow-up uh, post that scoping exercise, we'll do a, a, a one-to-one. So all the finalists, sorry, all the three uh, finalists from the um, Pitch Fest event, we'll get a one-to-one -one with one of um, our senior team at Granted to go through that, to make sure that we've understood the, the needs correctly and a playback and look at that. We live in a society that is becoming increasingly more conscious of what we eat and how we maintain a healthy lifestyle. The problem is we're bombarded with so many fitness programs from apps and diets and books and they don't always guarantee results. We are all unique individuals, so we have to find out what works well for us. This is where DNA Pal comes in. We've created a solution to provide reliable lifestyle advice to help you with your nutrition, your lifestyle, your supplements, for you and your DNA and for your genetics. So we test for the genes we need, and from the analysis, you receive complete personal tailored advice to suit you and nobody else. I'm Kate Scott, 
I'm a registered nutritional therapist, nutrigenetics specialist, and co-founder of DNA Pal. When Vicky first approached me with the idea of DNA Pal, I didn't hesitate. I'd been developing and using DNA-based diets and lifestyle plans for a few years already, and I saw the advantage immediately of being able to deliver these in a more dynamic, digital way. We began designing the app, which includes a proprietary algorithm that calculates the exact diet and lifestyle recommendations for an individual based on a combination between their unique DNA and their current diet, lifestyle, and, and health factors like hours of sleep, alcohol intake, age, etc. This is a really exciting time because our company sits within three major growing trend areas. The UK health tech market, which is the second fastest growing tech sector in the UK. The global wellness market, which is a really broad market, but healthy eating alone is worth over 700 billion US dollars. And the direct to consumer genetic testing market, which is set to exceed $3.4 billion by 2028. Our target market, is health conscious adults between 35 and 65 with a significant bias towards women. This market in the UK alone is about 46 million people. We can support this audience throughout their various life stages by becoming their pal for life. Although your DNA doesn't change, people's lives and needs do. Our app also supports DNA data from two of the world's largest direct-to-consumer DNA testing providers, Ancestry.com and 23andMe, giving us a combined global addressable market of about 27 million users. We also offer our own DNA tests, which cover over 700,000 genetic data points, and we guarantee customers complete data protection. We destroy samples after processing, and we will never sell DNA data. Our platform is simple. Users purchase our DNA test kits. We get a swab of their saliva and then we send it off. We analyze their DNA and provide the results through the app. There's total science behind it. It's no secret that the combination between our genes and lifestyle dictates our health. Our aim is to help you define attainable goals and reach them. With regards to our team, we've managed to attract an amazing array of talent across the core disciplines. Our revenue model is split over six different streams. We have our DNA tests, then app subscriptions and in-app purchases for things such as the personalized meal plans, the one-to-one -one online nutrition consults. We also plan to partner with retailers like supplement retailers via our online store and also the outcomes data that we'll be generating when looking at whether the users are improving their health through the, the recommendations that we provide. Investment in our company will broadly be spent in line with our overall OPEX, 40% uh, on the platform and the development of the tech, 30% on talent and people, and 30% on our marketing. Our competitive advantages are evident, not least that we start with real authority on the subject matter as we're both um, trained nutritional therapists and we see daily in clinic that everyone is completely unique and different and what works for one doesn't work for the other. We're completely evidence-based and within the app we have a balance of nutritional advice for the layman but for the science geeks we provide the latest research on genes so something for everyone. To us, this isn't just a business. We are genuinely excited at how many people we can help through our advice and suggestions with this app. Technology and people's willingness to interface with technology now allows, perhaps for the first time, the support of this nature at a vast scale. Just to round off, Kate and I work really well together. She's the science geek and I'm the power part of the app and it's a really lovely balance. And we just wanted to say thank you, Giants, for inviting us. And thank you, panel, for listening. We look forward to the Q&A in a few moments. Thanks. Well, I, I've certainly got a few questions, but I shall hold back for now. I'll dive in by asking, um, there's so much suspicion with regard to the science around DNA. I mean, it's so easy to say, we've done a test, send us the money, here's your results. And you know, what do you do? How do you prove that there is some real valid science going on that will have you know, real personal impact so um i'll answer that since that's my field of expertise <laughs> um i've been doing research into nutrigenomics for about five years now 
Um, and what we've decided to do within the actual app is to have a place. We know that it's not going to be interesting for everybody, and it is quite heavy reading to look into the studies behind the genes and the impact. But we've got a kind of a, a nerd area for advanced reading where we link all of the research papers that are behind every single claim that we're making, every gene that that we're that we've included. You sort, of, sorry, you sort of need a major nutritional partner, don't you, who, who does done the work for, or at least validates it for you. Do you have anyone lined up for that? Um, well, Vicky and I are both trained nutritional therapists. We have we are now bringing a medical doctor on board to try and raise the bar in that terms. Um, but open to suggestions. Hi, um, I'd like to ask you about um, <clears throat> the differentiating uh, part of your product because there's quite a lot of nutrigenomics at the moment on the market. Yep. It's a double question. I mean, how do you differentiate yourself in a very busy market? And are you going to expand, let's say, into metabolomics or other areas to offer a more um, premium? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think a lot of the companies that are currently on the market are uh, delivering the DNA interpretation in a much more static way. Um, so a lot of companies just do the PDF reporting. There are a few kind of interactive apps out there, but again, most of them really just give the, this is your genetic predisposition and that's the information. We try to take it further by doing the, okay, but so what do I do now? So we really want to handhold people because Vicky and I have actual clinical experience with knowing the, the kind of interventions to put in place, but also the fact that people are often not compliant or don't, you know, they want to be compliant, but they don't know the exact steps that they need to take in order to turn their health around. So it's about giving very, very relatable, easy information based on the DNA and the, an answer to kind of a more personalized question that we put together to be able to make it really easy and accessible for people to make those changes. Um, and that's also where we brought in the gamification um, because we want to make it fun for people. It can be, you know, it's quite dry knowledge in some ways. So we're trying to make it a bit fun and exciting and with the hand holding. So if it comes to asking people to cut down their caffeine or drinking more cups of water or getting more hours of sleep, we don't just say that, we, we guide them as to how to do that. We give them little reminders. We might show them kind of th nice things that they can use as replacements, um, really making it relatable and easy for people. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, sharing top tips, recipes, um, things that we know work in clinic on that one-to-one -one basis. And because we do work a lot on a one-to-one -one basis with clients, and I have a clinic in Harley Street, we see what works and what doesn't. And w w one thing we really see is we see that everybody is completely unique. And a supplement that we might suggest to one person, we also see that doesn't necessarily suit the next person. So for us, using the genetics part to really recognize the individuality and uniqueness of every person and working with their uniqueness and using our skills, like Kate said, our skills already in clinic, which we know what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, and we see huge improvements. And not only that, where, where DNA Pal came from was it changed my life so much doing genetic testing. And it was me stood in Tesco's one day when I had all these PDF reports and I was stood in the vegetable aisle and I just went, I, I don't care about the reports. I just want someone to tell me what to eat for my genetics to make my um, me healthier or, or better. And that's when I phoned Kate because Kate and I had studied together. And she had, I went into cancer and Kate went into nutrigenomics and I said, look, we've got the name let's do the where now how to do it you know how to make those changes and, and that's where the challenges have come in because the gamification means that we can keep retention we can actually help people make those changes and support them on a daily basis we also have the ability um, to click through to one-to-one -one and pay for consultations so they can speak to real people that are trained at our level 
Um, so again, it's not just all just tech, tech, tech. Some people don't like bots and tech and, you know, some people want just a real person at times. So all of that is included as well into the app. I think that's, that's actually a good differentiator. That's a fairly comprehensive answer. I'm going to have to curtail you now, uh, ladies, because we've run out of time on the Q&A. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, thank you. Thank you for that um, very detailed explanation. Um, and, and great presentation too. Thank you. Good health relies on our understanding and clearly communicating what's going on when we become ill. But that isn't always possible. Most of the 500,000 plus people affected by long COVID have no way to recognise, record and report the full range of their symptoms and concerns. Current limited medical frameworks are getting in the way and diagnosing the individual symptoms and syndromes isn't really enough. Some symptoms of long COVID are obvious, yet others vary widely. They appear to be autoimmune, autonomic, or relate to post-viral syndromes. There's an emerging link to conditions like mast cell activation disorder and ME. I've been living with mast cell activation disorder for a decade now, and for those like me, such medical exclusions are not a new problem. In the UK alone, 70,000 plus people risk poor health and outcomes due to under-recognised autoimmunity, dysautonomia and hidden disabilities. Another 2.5 million more have unaddressed comorbidities or complex issues. That's 30 million people across Europe and an estimated billion people worldwide. Up to now, significant cognitive, cultural and all kinds of practical issues have combined with bias and exclusions to hide the problem and prevent the scale of it from becoming fully apparent. Missed diagnosis and misdiagnosis cost the NHS £4.3 billion in 2013, plus the loss in productivity and increased costs to the state. The incalculable cost of the COVID crisis has further highlighted these issues and the urgent critical need for action. The 43 new long COVID centres are most welcome, yet current indications are that they will not have a deep enough understanding or provided with the richness of data that they need, greatly limiting their value. And what's to be done for those others who are still being left out? Five years ago, we began to use our lived experience to research and develop tools to help those like us with hidden, complex disorders and conditions to better identify, track and share our symptoms and concerns. Our first product is a screening questionnaire designed to help everyone uncover critical complex health issues, including those seen with post-COVID. Responses to our 200 questions are used to build indicative charts and dashboards that people share with their GP, nurse or care provider to aid further referrals and diagnosis. The information and insights we help people gather now will help everyone identify patterns and insights that are currently being missed, enable easier interpretation of symptoms now and facilitate better diagnosis in the future. Even with vaccines on the horizon, we are all being asked to assess and manage our well-being and health from home. Many of us will need remote or family support, especially if we have learning disabilities and differences or cognitive issues. So our tailored support will ensure that everyone can participate and get the most out of doing so. These questions will also help mitigate the current lack and predicted ongoing shortage of suitable medical services, tests and diagnostics. But for many of the conditions we're looking at, the current tests are often misleading or the problems don't show up in expected ways. Uncovering this missing meaningful data within the context of our framework means that we can finally build much needed indicative and pre-diagnostic tools and establish better pathways. Without these, our future machine learning and AI-driven tools will remain biased and ineffective. Over the past year, our team has applied their extensive expertise to refine our service and proposition and ensure that this best meets critical clinical and social need. 
our service delivery platform and proprietary symptom framework are now going through the last stages of user testing before we prepare our pilot services. We now need to secure our next stage funding to help us refine our services further and deliver our much needed video and in-person support programmes. We hope you will take this opportunity to help us help everyone get and share a better picture of their health and to understand more about what they will need to do to stay safe and well at this time and in the future. Okay, uh, Q&A time. Well, if nobody else is stepping up, then I shall step in. Uh, I, my, my, my main uh, question here is to do with the um, with, with people actually filling it in. That looked like a very detailed form, about 200 questions. And I'm guessing that a lot of your potential uh, audience are elderly. So from a practical point of view, uh, have you tested this at all? Uh, have you uh, had any insight as to um, whether people actually will, will fill it in um, such a detailed form with, with people um, actually That's a very important in? question. And it's actually one that we asked at a very early stage. Um, and this is why we have support built in. Um, so it, absolutely having this number of questions is incredibly challenging. And we've had the convention in digital healthcare is that you shouldn't ask that many questions at once. However, unless you do so, you don't get a complete picture. And supporting people to be asked that question, you could break it up into different se sessions if you like, because the, the, our, our platform supports that. But asking all of the questions at once also encourages people to think in a more systemic way about their health and what they're experiencing. So this is not something that people would necessarily do um, every single day um, unless there was a real uh, clinical need to do so. But it is the comprehensive glue that could hold a lot of other things together. Um, and absolutely support is critical. Um, and understanding that support, what people with cognitive impairments might need, what people who are neurodivergent like myself would need. Um, I think, you know, it, it, the COVID era has taught us that, support, you know, that, that you can build the best products and the best tools, but people actually need a lot of help and support and explanation to be able to use them properly. So we abs that's absolutely built in from the beginning. And the first ever user was my father, who had severe cognitive impairments due to autoimmune. And he actually taught me what was possible and um we do need to do a lot more testing you're absolutely right and we look forward to doing so thank you i actually have a question as well um congratulations i think it's a very good idea and we are missing real life data about many of these problems uh, but to my understanding you are designing sets of questions based on a particular problem. So you cannot have like a, a set for all the problems. That's one question. And then second, it wasn't very clear if you have deployed at the moment your product. Okay, so uh, to answer your first question, um, the questions are actually really quite broad um, because what people can experience with autoimmune and with um, autonomic disorders and with hidden disabilities is incredibly broad. So we cover quite a few physical symptoms, but also what are people are experiencing in cognitive and social functioning. And it, 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 it also incorporates a, a kind of body scan, really, but what people are experiencing, so it complements other tests. And, it, and we have an actual fact, we, we have our own platform that we're building because we have development skills in-house. I pretty much built most of it myself to bring us to this prototype stage and um although we do have some um minor technical challenges we've had people using it for the past three or four months on a, on a, on a um sort of path finding basis so we have our platform it's not an app it's a mobile accessible website um but that allows us to be able to iterate our design and to be very very uh, user focused user reactive 
and to adapt as we go along, which is very, very difficult and expensive to do once you've moved to apps. Great. And, okay, Simon, you need to take yourself off mute, fella. Simon, you're on. Yeah, thank you. Um, would it not be better to have the engagement process driven by voice as opposed to um, the conventional? It, that is something that we're exploring. Uh, we also looked at um, haptics to help people, to help prompt people to, to look at certain parts of their bodies at various times. Um, we, we're really, really interested in what novel interfaces that we can use, especially for people who have sensory impairments. Um, and who might otherwise struggle to even to have, they, they might have um, poor proprioception or interoception. Um, so whatever can pr prompt people. And voice is a very, very powerful prompt. So thank you for reminding us of that. That's great. Um, time for one more question, if anybody has one, a really pressing one. I've certainly got another one if no one does, but uh, I shall give the opportunity for someone else to ask. Uh, I have a... Um... I have a question. Is in one of your um, you mentioned that you are going to do pre-diagnostic. Mm -hmm. Is the pathway you are looking at at the moment is it meant to augment the GP at the moment or to replace it in the future? Um, to aug very much to augment right now, but the insights and the um, the. the, the uh, the models that we're building can be used to develop automated systems in the future. But one of the things that we're really clear on is the value that cl clinicians' observations bring, whether they're doctors, clinic nurses, all sorts of practitioners, which I actually think is hugely underrecognized. So we very much see ourselves as supportive technology rather than disruptive, but the data that we gather is, is going to be absolutely critical to make sure that where, the, where you can't have in-person services, either through economic or practical means, that whatever is delivered is as good as you can get. That's wonderful. Thanks very much. And really good idea. Thank you very much. It's come out of very, very deep critical necessity, uh, but it's a real privilege to be working in this area. I can certainly see um, from having worked in the frontline medical and, and understand the doctor's problem that this is a problem that needs to be solved. And um, yeah, it's great that you're gaining some sort of innovations uh, to help out in that area. So really well done. Thank you very much. And next up, we've got Nevis Q. Yes. Hello, everybody from Germany. Great. So um, I will share just my screen. So I'm very happy that we can uh, present uh, our company Nevis Q with our brand Nevis Cura here today. My name is uh, Christian Kind. I am one of the managing directors of this startup. And uh, we were established in 2016. We are a team of 16 people at the moment based in the western part of Germany. And we want to make sure uh, to give room to, uh, for humanity, room for security, for everybody, which means that whenever somebody needs special um, security or humanity, we want to help there with uh, technology. And our special focus is on elderly people. What does that mean? Uh, for example, we developed a smart bed sensor, uh, which you can uh, easily attach uh, to the bed. And for example, when somebody wants to get up from the bed and you know this person is um, easily uh, to fall, um, then you can get alerted and then you can help this person on the way to the bathroom, for example. But you may also um, see if there are changes in the uh, bad exit behavior throughout the time. Or you might see that maybe a person is um, needing more time to get up from the bed uh, in the last uh, days, which means that maybe the person get more frail, for example. And um, as you see, the, per, uh, the sensor, uh, which can also be like brown, for example, looking like the bed, um, is very discreet on the one hand, still looking um, quite good. But you may also use this technology, for example, uh, just a few centimeters over the ground. And uh, when you use this technology, uh, you might detect faults, for example, within seconds. And as you see, again, the uh, sensor is very discreet and not really... Um, yeah, just uh, catching uh, into the eye, 
And uh, that's always what we want to achieve because we want that the elderly people, they just, just live their life like they would like to. They don't need to wear anything. They don't need to be like uh, frightened to that the camera catches everything and so on. But still, they know that whenever they need help or they need support, they will get it fast and reliably. And uh, still, they can um, get their uh, independence and dignity. So um, they yeah, just live their life and don't have to wear anything so that everybody sees, oh, I need help. Um, still, the technology is very easy to use and implement and uh, can also be maintained very easily. And uh, looking into the future with all this data that we gather, uh, we may also have something like health indicators so that we can see uh, illnesses or um, growing frailty uh, much earlier. From a business model point of view, we want to make sure that it is um, affordable for uh, everybody, which means that uh, you can buy the hardware for a reasonable price. And then if you want to have more, we have something like a platform and then you pay a monthly fee. But still, if you only want to get alerted, for example, when somebody falls or somebody gets out of the bed, you can only buy the hardware if you wish to. And I think we are definitely uh, in a market that will be growing uh, in the next years because we have the demographic change. And uh, so we want to support here with our technologies and um, yeah, help elderly people to live a, digni uh, yeah, a life of dignity and independence and also remain in assisted living or in their private, uh, private households uh, as long as possible. Um, yeah, we have been awarded uh, quite a few times already, for example, EIT Health or um, the European Commission or also the German government. And uh, at the moment we are active in uh, Germany mostly, but also in Spain, for example, or Belgium. So, thank you very much and now I am happy to answer your questions. Great, thanks very much. Um, who are your main clients at the moment? So at the moment, is it's mostly nursing homes, actually, uh, but also assisted living facilities. But we are um, moving more into the direction of private households. So for us, it was easier to start with like nursing homes and so on to train uh, the models, because in the end, uh, we don't um, use only sensors. But the, the key ingredient, so to say, is the software behind that. And it was easier to train that in nursing homes, for example. So how many nursing homes would, are you operational in? Uh, so at the moment, we have around 130 installations. Hi, um, thank you so much for the presentation. I think um, what you are building, anybody operating the care in this space is one of the biggest needs that we will have, so much welcome. Uh, but it's also one of the most fragmented markets. In Germany alone, there are 9,000 nursing homes, or care homes here in the UK, over 5,000. So any model that you will tackle is going to be very fragmented. So I wanted to ask you, even though you might be pivoting into B2C or direct to consumer, uh, how are you going to scale with uh, B2B partnerships? And who mm. are you competing for that? Um, yeah, so we uh, quite tested uh, some, um, some cases there and uh, we found that actually it's quite a good strategy to let these customers come to us. So we see actually some, so for example, when we talk to nursing homes, uh, fall is a really big uh, topic. So when we uh, make sure that uh, when people are researching for fall, um, they might come to us, actually it makes it uh, quite fast. And even now in the times of COVID, we hear from a lot of startups, they have problems to get clients. We actually have a, a quite big interest and in nursing homes coming to us. And But on the other hand, uh, we are also trying to, to work a lot with networks, for example, that we just spread the mouth and uh, that everybody or not everybody, but a lot of people get to know us. Uh, same question. Are you integratable with um, care planning software? I know Germany is very far behind on care planning software, but is that something you, you're working on or have an API? Um, yes, we have an API. We have a RESTful API, for example. Um, we don't have a software that we are integrated at the moment, but we are talking to some software providers in Germany to, uh, to do that probably next year then. And have you had any traction with hospitals at all? 
Um, yeah, we just started with some uh, trials. Um, maybe some of you know Helios from Germany. Um, it's a quite big uh, hospital chain, and we have a trial there with uh, five uh, facilities at the moment. Oh, that's great. Well, I can certainly say we could have done with that equipment when I was on the front line of the, um, uh, of, especially with side rooms. So, yeah, this is uh, it's definitely a piece of uh, useful equipment. I can see the use for it. Um, I'm afraid that's um, our Q&A time allocation, Christian. Really appreciate um, what you've done there. Great presentation. Um, but we're going to have to move on now. And um, yeah, thank you. Our, our next uh, our next company up is Alio. Thanks again, everyone. It's a great opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, I'm Dave. I'm one of the co-founder and CEO of Alio. We're focused on remote patient monitoring uh, for vulnerable patient populations, initially starting with dialysis and heart failure. Uh, if we look at dialysis uh, worldwide, it's a large, pretty large number of patients, about 3.2 million uh, patients worldwide, about a million uh, kind of in Europe. They suffer from three big issues that results in them stay, staying a lot uh, in hospitals, uh, such as heart failure, uh, having potassium imbalances leading to arrhythmias, causes a lot of uh, ER visits. Also, the fact that their uh, vascular access in their arm is effectively their lifeline, allowing them to get the treatment that they need, can get blocked about 25% of the time in any given year, ends up resulting in a lot of frequent interventions that are required. Uh, in the U.S., if you look at uh, this, it's a very small percentage of the population in terms of 1% of the Medicare covered population, but approaching almost 10% of their claim costs and about $35 billion. It's a pretty, pretty big problem. Uh, the big issue is that they're, in, they're spending almost uh, two weeks a year in an ICU. And so we see that uh, effectively worldwide. Um, they've mandated monitoring for most of these patients. So they have to either be brought into a clinic to have an imaging procedure done maybe once a month, once a quarter, Blood draws are, are done as well to ensure where they're, uh, whether or not the, the patient is doing okay. And unfortunately, it's a pretty clunky system right now. Uh, so a patient gets a phone call maybe a few uh, days later after the blood draws come back from the lab, and it's pretty inefficient, and it's been uh, really been tackled that something has to be done. So we've seen a lot of providers are addressing this lack of data with some pretty labor-intensive manual processes. So actually, uh, the team up at uh, NHS South Tees, they realized that this was a big problem. They actually wanted to tackle it by hiring a series of nurses to actually drive out uh, to patients' homes a couple times a week, get blood draws, get vital, and see that they actually could reduce those hospitalizations and visits. But as you might expect, uh, the cost of uh, doing that is pretty expensive, and they wanted to see if there was a, a more automated way uh, to get that data. Thankfully, through some of the work that we had been doing already, we were able to bring in our end-to-end -end platform to start working with them. So it is a wearable that is worn by the patient. Um, it is shower proof, sweat proof. The battery life right now is running between about 60 and 90 days. The adhesive is running on average between seven and 14 days. Um, the patient receives from their clinic, the trust, a box that basically they uh, go home with. They plug it, that bedside hub there in the middle uh, into their home. It is a chronic care population. We wanted to make it as easy for them as possible. We did a worldwide deal with Vodafone actually. So it's up and running as soon as the patient plugs it in places the patch on their arm, everything's up and running. There's nothing else for them to press, do, set up, no Wi-Fi, no smartphone app to download. Everything is up and running. And then on the clinician side, it we have a portal and an API uh, for uh, integration, uh, but it's all focused on notifications. And the benefit in this patient population is that there are international guidelines around where patients need to be, so we don't have to come in and disrupt the clinical workflow. It already exists today, and people know really well what to do. And what allows us to get data and push past what, you know, Philips or Massimo are doing with a little, uh, you know, red light on your finger in the hospital or even an iWatch or uh, Fitbit uh, in the consumer world is that we're able to actually not just get that data that's underneath the, the, the skin, but actually effectively get a 3D holographic image of whatever vessel that we're above. So this would be the vascular access for the kidney patient, the radial artery for heart failure patient, uh, the carotid artery for stroke patients. It's a pretty innovative way to get a much richer data set in a seamless manner uh, and not need any patient or physician uh, interaction to get alerts when something is going wrong. In addition to uh, what we can uh, pull out of that, that rich data set, we translate that into more metrics. So being able to go past your basic vitals that a lot of wearables can do today to getting really into your cardiovascular status. So I mentioned dialysis patients. Part of the reason why we started there is their high rate of complications. So looking at heart failure, I mentioned 40% will be in a, uh, hospitalized. 
The fact that uh, their uh, vascular access is going to have about a 30% rate of failure in any given year. Um, and then also looking at things like electrolytes, being able to non-invasively get potassium without looking at an ECG certainly has a lot of value to be able to do that today. Um, it's obviously important to be accurate. So it's it's great that we can put up a lot of uh, metrics up there, but if it's not worthwhile if we don't have the confidence of clinicians. We've shown our ability to do so with patients placing this product on themselves at home without us having to, to intervene and comparing ourselves to, to, to both blood draws and some of the systems that are utilized today uh, that are either clunky or require a uh, an actual blood stick. If we look at what that means in terms of costs and savings, this was actually uh, an NHS patient that we were tracking over time. We showcased the, the, the value of their, their, their clinician had changed one of their parameters uh, for one of their drugs that's relatively expensive. They otherwise wouldn't have presented to a clinic for, for a blood draw for a few more weeks. We were able to detect it early and save uh, save their provider about a thousand pounds uh, just in that month alone, not to include the cost of also going, getting transported to a center to get the blood draw and everything else they need. And that same compelling outcomes are across over 250 clinical subjects that we've been able to, to work with so far. Uh, we've seen really strong data. And I think that makes us best in class in terms of a wearable. We certainly stand on the uh, shoulders of giants, but the ability to go past where consumer products are, the limited insights from some more of the vitals companies, and then even the uh, the, the very uh, robust metrics uh, for some of the sim single metrics and plannable companies that we see today means that we have a really big market that we can, we can tackle long term. Uh, in terms of remote monitoring, we're already starting to see that pull happen for us. There's a real unique opportunity to start here in the dialysis market in terms of the alignment of the needs of the physician, the patient, the provider, uh, and the payer as well, and, and what's out there in terms of reducing hospital stays, making the patient life a lot easier, and being able to redefine the current treatment paradigm that results in lots of uh, excess visits and excess uh, costs. And whether in the U.S. and you're looking at a fee for more of a fee-for-service model, a value-based model, or even a single-payer model. Uh, we can fit in really well with that. There's a good incentive uh, for folks to, to work with us in terms of uh, cost savings, also new revenue uh, here in the U.S. for some of the providers. So there's a really great balance of the ability of the uh, from, a, from a business standpoint to create traction and create a great flywheel uh, for what we're doing. Certainly some of the new reimbursement changes, the value-based care changes are certainly coming into place in terms of what we're able to do as well. We've got some amazing partners uh, that across both the, the US, the UK, and, and, and Europe as well, Maastricht, and then uh, the University of Vienna as well that we'll be starting off with uh, here in uh, Q1, Q2 uh, in 2021. Um, so we've already been doing a lot of work with the NHS and the Southeast team, uh, tracking a, a small cohort of their patients over time. Pretty excited about that opportunity and the team that's bringing all this to date is a really good blend of both med tech and medical uh, and, and high tech uh, innovators that have strong background in um, startups, quite a few exits under the team's belt as well, which we think makes us a really interesting opportunity to bring world-class wearables that generate clinically actionable data and then integrate those alerts into current clinical workflows uh, for the best outcomes uh, for patients. So thanks again uh, for your time and certainly happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Dave. Nice presentation. And uh, that looks like a very interesting bit of kit. I have to ask, um, what is the what's the cost um, for uh, units to take this on board and, and implement it? Sure. So so right now um, it, it, we've been looking in the U.S. It's been a, a per member per month model. So it's about one hundred dollars uh, per member per month. Uh, they do have reimbursement uh, that comes in uh, to cover about two hundred dollars per uh, per member per month. So uh, it's a pretty um, for the whoever implements it. It's effectively a cost share. Um, so we've been able to, I think, at that price point, um, be able to. It is a premium product. There's a lot. There's about 16 sensors in, inside of the patch. We also provide the entire service, so we're covering the cost of the cellular modem, for example. It's fully baked. So uh, on our end, we provide. If there's any new kit that needs to be sent out to a patient, directly drop shipped to them. Everything is fully covered on our end. Uh, we can see if things aren't working, uh, and that whole piece is uh, pulled in. So right now, it's about $100 uh, per, per patient per month. And so we're looking at what the pricing model will be in Europe a little bit more. Hi, um, great um, solution. Uh, I got a question regarding partnerships. Um, at the moment, what I see is a lot of uh, B2C or B2, B2G, if it's a hospital. Um, yeah. But your sector, the RPM sector and IoT is in consolidation already. So 
which kind of uh, ecosystems are you seeing yourself in one or two years time? Because everybody is positioning themselves in the horizontals uh, in mm -hmm. the RPM. Sure, absolutely. So I think um, what we, we, I think we looked at attacking the problem two ways, right? So found a very interesting patient population where we could, I think, really showcase value uh, and start driving uh, a, a very strong business model uh, from a distribution standpoint to a reimbursement standpoint, et cetera. Um, but yes, we are entertaining um, conversations with a few different folks that are in the RPM space that maybe are in the heart failure space or um, looking at folks that are doing managed uh, population care uh, as well for a dialysis or heart failure population, uh, integrating uh, our, our platform into what they're doing. And there's on ramps and off ramps at every opportunity. So uh, from a patch perspective, we can feed right into somebody else's hub. At the hub level, we can feed right into somebody else's uh, uh, care management platform. So it's certainly been set up to allow that uh, to happen uh, across the way. How have you dealt with the issue of data validation, data updating, different participants inputting data? A lot of a lot of the, this sector is looking at sort of blockchain as being a potential solution there in terms of the sort of data um, flow. Is that something? Do you have solutions for that? So right now, uh, that, that's certainly something on, on the horizon for us. Uh, but right now, what we've done is that... Uh, we, it's all raw data to the cloud. We don't. There's no patient identifying information anywhere until the pull request actually gets made uh, at the clinic site. Uh, so that they're the only people that have access to that. So it's not using like a full. You know, that's kind of being set up, if you will, to be almost in a blockchain ledger type format. Uh, so we already utilize a ledger today that is completely different and uh, apart from the actual data flow setup from patch to hub to cloud to clinic. The ledger then actually just pulls to whoever the um, the, the box, the kit has been given to, uh, that's how it actually gets pulled in. So it is set up to, to be able to integrate that in the future, but it's a pretty already a, a system that is uh, well designed to, to protect uh, patient information today. So your cloud-based database um, is, is holding data that is compatible with NHS Fire and various other US comparables. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's multi-capable basically. Exactly. So it's kind of already GDPR compliant and it's already set up with there's an AWS uh, instance in each of those countries on all those pieces are set up then for compatibility with that data flow. I have a question actually regarding patients. As you are probably aware, many of the patients now are uh, demanding access to, access to their health data. Uh, do you have any plans to have an interface for patients as well? That's one question. And the second one, you presented some of the devices existing on the market as being competitors, uh, but did you think you could integrate with the data they provide and maybe uh, enhance, enhance your product? Yeah, so absolutely. So from a design standpoint, we actually spent uh, um, a couple uh, months actually embedded in a trust, actually kind of understanding the dialysis workflow uh, and you know how it was different in, in, in different sectors. Uh, and so actually what we realized is we wanted, they wanted limited feedback initially uh, to the patient for this patient population it is a chronic po population clinicians didn't want people calling them up every time because of the high rate of, of failure or issues they didn't want them calling up every time a metric moves by 10 percent so initially right now there is feedback via the hub that if something's wrong the white flashes call your doc call your uh, your provider and, and, and get moving um, there is an api for a smartphone app uh, that will actually start to then pull in the data that's relevant for the patient uh, but i think that'll be more things like nutrition data so potassium imbalances for example are highly driven by uh, diet in this patient population so we're starting to track what can we do in terms of diet recommendations if the patient is getting close to, to an issue that's not fully implemented uh, quite yet in terms of the front end uh, user interface but the api for that is already there um, then from the standpoint of integration, we, we are certainly looking, we're certainly very open to partnerships, um, working with others. Uh, we're looking at heart failure companies or ECG companies, for example, that might have a full six lead, integrating with us to get a full comprehensive cardiovascular suite. Uh, there's a sepsis company, for example, that has done um, looking at uh, population health sepsis uh, alerts, but they don't have an actual hardware, it's just pure software. So integrating with them, pulling all of our data together so they're not just looking at a limited data set, a heart rate, uh, temp, um, and SPO2, now we can push past that into BP, potassium uh, flow, looking at if, the, if their, their vessels are getting collapsed. That's a more uh, rich data set for potential uh, sepsis alerts. So we're looking at both software and hardware partners uh, to integrate the data with. 
Thanks, Dave. I'm afraid that's our time run out now. But um, yeah, very competent job there and looks like a very interesting bit of kit you've got. So thanks very much for uh, presenting that with us today. And hopefully we've got uh, melting ice, ice cubes ready to uh, rock and roll uh, for our next presentation. Hello, my name is Maldi and Maddox, and I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you about Melting Ice Cubes, our health platform. We simplify health search and we help people to build health literacy. We know that this is important because of family circumstances we have faced, but actually you talk to most people who have been through health challenge and they will all tell you that it is associated with anxiety and concern and fear. So people do look online, they are using e-health tools, but there's always that risk element, isn't there? Who, what and quality. Also the volume of information that's available. What's the right question that you need to ask to pull back the information you need? These are some of the problems that, that we need to fix. Uh, medical terminology and being able to manage your health with medical professionals. If you understand your health, then you'll do a much better job of having conversations with medics. Um, I think the NHS model does actually foster a delegated healthcare culture, but if we can address that, and if we can equip people to be able to speak in partnership, that has benefits for everybody. So the solution that we came up with was our platform. Uh, you type in a condition, you can see here, we populate your screen then with related content. So we search the internet uh, with our algorithms and we sort information and categorize it. We're currently refining all of this with that we've built a validator tool that is indexing and um, giving us even more refinement on the information we present. You can see here there's an everyday life search that, that's in, in, uh, in play and it's helping somebody to find out how it affects their day-to-day -day life with travel. You might have more than one condition, that's absolutely fine. One, two, three, we don't mind. Add them all in here and we will bring back the information that you require. So sorted information, fast tracking your search. Our target market then has to be uh, playing to people who want information related to health and it does. So we've got Joe Public, but we've also got medicals, uh, medics in terms of GPs, consultants, uh, nurses, support organisations and students, they all do come to the site and use it as a reference source and that's um, we, we have our international users too. So we can tell you that we've got around 30,000 people trafficking through the site and uh, they're drawn from 22 countries, mainly the UK, but 22 countries that are regular users hitting us. So that creates an exciting target market uh, the possibility to go worldwide and our revenue model is a freemium ecosystem so we're building a value network we are not in competition we want to collaborate we want to associate with the suppliers of goods and services um, in the benefit of b2c and b2b relationships and what does that look like premium subscriptions social prescribing, medtech partnerships, sponsored content from pharma, affiliate sales, click through products and services, consulting. We don't look at advertising yet, but that is something that we can also add on in a controlled way. Uh, so our acceleration strategy is absolutely essential now. We need to uh, push on with our product development. We need to develop the ecosystem and establish the brand. And so the investment that we seek is in support of this. We've spent 350000 to date, and that's got us uh, an MPV with users. An investment of a million um, should see us deliver our plans and year one yield 17 and a half million in income and that's conservative modeling competitive advantage nobody does does this like we do it we stitch the elements together in a new and interesting way and we really are building an ecosystem an environment that is capable of supporting multiple audiences for a variety of reasons the um, validator tool is really exciting because this enables you to view our information at a broad high level or really drill down to precise detail, even down to what is it I'm going to look at now? Is it going to be a video? Is it a journal? Is it a report? Who's giving me this? And we, our services point 
the UK market to local, regional and country support. And of course, that can be replicated abroad. So here's Colin. He's much more comfortable now. Um, he's not bouncing happy, but he's comfortable and he knows where his information is. And it's on our platform and it also gives him access to an ecosystem that gives him goods and services. We've answered a lot of those questions. We definitely know who, what and the quality. And there's some larger society um, improvements too. It does create efficiencies for healthcare delivery definitely supports mental health and improves the health of the nation generally. So this is the team that have built the platform. Um, experience team here, we buy in additional services where needed, but if you want to speak to us, there we are. And if you want to join us on this journey um, in building an ecosystem that supports health, we would love to speak to you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Very interesting. Um, over to the panel for questions. Um, I can start. So where have you got to with validate? So I appreciate it's early days, um, but where have you got to with validating the different kind of revenue options that you've mentioned? Um, I've had conversations in each of those spaces uh, that we mentioned there. So we've spoken to people regarding the NHS and um, social prescribing. I've spoken to um, some of them on this here. Universities, colleges, businesses, charities. In each of the areas that I have listed, I've had physical conversations with people and their interest in being able to work with us. I got a question. Hi, I'm Olia. Congratulations on the how far you come with the platform. Um, my, my question is about the scope of the platform, because obviously from a content perspective and from a segment perspective, we cannot do everything at the same time. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, how do you sort out the complexity of dealing with any probable combination from a content perspective, meaning who are you partnering with to bring those localized a more patient-centric um, uh, services just to fast track that. And maybe if you could offer from all these conversations you just had mentioned with the different segments, which is going to be your starting point or where you see the most traction. I think that that is the challenge that we've always faced. And if I can just give some context why we've made that decision. So as our, as our family had to support somebody who had degenerative condition from the childhood into adulthood, that means you don't have the luxury of being able to confine your thought process to one area. You know, you are immediately impacted by understanding the condition, understanding the treatment pathway, the medications, the therapies, how does this affect education, um, the, care, the care support in the community, how do you get on with life, travel, work, etc. And so I have always had a 360-degree view of impacts to a person and a family of ill health. So with the challenge we, we've had for about 10, 12 years was everybody always saying, you can't do it all. But with the team that we've put together, with the AI uh, that we've built and the algorithms, we are able now, you take any condition, you plug it into the platform, and though the, the tool goes and drags the information in. So every day we get requests from the public saying, can you add my condition, add my condition. I think we've got over 650 yeah, conditions there. Um, so and the tool is the, is the instrument that goes out and sorts the content, and then we organise it. Um, Mitchell's working on the validation tool now, and so the data um, is being checked, referenced, organised. It's like we've taken a library that had millions of books on the floor and we're now putting them on a shelf in a neat and organised way. I think that's really important for a person who comes to the platform. They can, they can segment how do they want their information. Is it medical related? Is it life related? The social media layer on top enables them to reach out to other people, create communities. And that, that is why the ecosystem can work. You know, the people that I've heard today on this call, you know, Ali, Chin, Nevis, DNA, Power, Glowfax, those are all 
people that could be part of our ecosystem were not competitors. At yeah, all. That's answer the question. So you offer the platform as the service. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And what's your revenue model? It is built around the different um, strands that we can attract. So, for example, the man in the street he can always access this for free, but he might want to buy the premium model. He might also want to, do, to purchase products and services. Medical deliveries, we may uh, develop relationships with them that enables us to build the social prescribing. Medtech would be affiliate. Um, care support would be subscription. Pharma would be sponsored content. Organisations and businesses would use us in their employee wellbeing offering. Education, we could build an education hub because lots of medical students use, they love our platform. One, one word in or, you know, all of the content that you need in one click. So it's a variety of um, ways to attract revenue and our strategy is to onboard a sales team and partnership development. Uh, team. Do you see this as a global proposition or purely UK based? No, absolutely global. And but we built the tool first just for the UK with all UK IP. Uh, what we found is we've had it's from 97 countries, 22 countries use us regularly. So this model can be replicated in every country. You mentioned IP. Do you have IP in terms of the search algorithms? Is that the, is that the point? I think our IP is in the data collation and the way that we present it. So it's the way that we put things together. Joel, would you agree with that? Yeah, I'd agree with that. The data is obviously public data, which is the way that we take that data and present it um, in a way that makes sense to people for their particular time of search and their particular time of, of life, you know, whether that comes in from a health point of view. What is your trust model? Because presumably you're collecting a lot of data about the user in background and that data um, it, I, I was going to say traditionally, but I guess that's as good as any, traditionally is being sold to Google. Is that a sort of approach that you'll take as a revenue model? No. 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 And how will you prove that that is the case? Um, I'm gathering uh, personal data about users. So we will gather enough data so they can log into an account, but their accounts remain anonymous. There's nothing we can identify users with. Okay. We, we build up trust on, we ask for very limited information, but the more a uh, user is willing to give us, the more we can refine the data for their requirement. So it's a, it's a trust model that they'll trust us. As they trust us, they might provide more information, maybe on so their age we'll range, their data, uh, and then we can make services more specific to them. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have to uh, call an end to it there. We've got, we've allocated time has run out. We now need to make our decisions and um, me and the judges are going to need to have a chat. So thanks very much for that presentation. Yeah, really thank, you time. Time. Thank, you. thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Esterby, Health Tech Lead. And hi, I'm Dawn Carhart, Health Tech Manager. Barclays Eagle Labs are proud to be the premier innovation partner for the Giant Health 2020 virtual event. Today, we're going to give you a bit of an overview of Barclays Eagle Labs and what we're doing to support the health tech ecosystem. So what is Eagle Labs? So with a growing number of Eagle Labs across the UK, our focus is to help accelerate UK scale ups, promote collaborative innovation across the entire ecosystem and enable access to training on new and emerging technologies. Since launching five years ago, we've grown our network to 26 sites across the UK each one unique in its partnership and offering. Our collaborative spaces offer co-working, private office, rapid prototyping facilities, and enable startups to connect with like-minded businesses to help them innovate and grow. Our reach is far wider than our physical network, and around about two years ago, we started looking at particular industry sectors where we felt they were right for disruption, where there were more startups and investment emerging, and we identified health tech as one of those, along with a few others that are listed here. We have a network of peers, mentors, partners and experts who can help you achieve your business ambitions and have built up an ecosystem of over 360 health tech businesses. We have over 600 residents in our physical network who have raised over a billion pounds in funding. And by being a member of Eagle Labs, you'll have access to 38 innovation partners. And if you're a health tech business or in the health tech industry and space, then if you want to find out more, then please get in touch via our website. 
um, which is on screen, um, also our email and our Twitter page as well. Or if you're at the Giant Health event over the next couple of days, feel free to visit our virtual stand where you'll be able to live chat with ourselves and some of our colleagues and also have access to some video and other content about the proposition. Well, I guess this makes us live and I want to thank everybody for their contributions today. There's been some really strong pitches. There's been some excellent ideas and uh, it's been a really tough decision. And for the record, just so everyone knows, every category was a split decision. It wasn't clear in any area. So um, take consolation for anyone that hasn't um, won anything today. You probably have won something as far as the judges are concerned. So um, without further delay, uh, to put you uh, out of your suspense, there were three categories and an overall overall winner. So we had the pollen, the sprout and the bean categories. So in the pollen category, our winner was chin. Well done. Excellent job. Um, in our sprout category, our winner was Kepler. Well done. Excellent job to you guys. And in our bean category, the winner was Alio. So very, very well done to everybody in their individual categories. Um, they were all tightly contended. And speaking of tight contention, the overall winner um, sparked a huge debate on the uh, judges panel. So um, it's been very exciting times. There's been some differences of opinion, but we have come out with an overall winner. And um, now that I've rolled out the suspense just about as long as I can, I shall announce really well done to Chin, who win the overall award. Congratulations for very high standards this year. Well done, Chin. Thanks all for getting involved. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.